Hi, it's Anna. Welcome back to Books on the Go. I'm here with an August wrap up. So I'll go through, these are in no particular order. First, some books that I read for Women in Translation Month. So the first one is Asleep by Banana Yoshimoto. I have talked about these in a separate video where I did an update of, of how I was going with the Women in Translation books. So I'll link that below. Um, and I'll, so I'll just speak briefly about these ones. But this is Asleep by Banana Yoshimoto. And I really enjoyed this. I love her writing. It's very clean. It's very matter of fact, but it doesn't feel uh, functional or pedestrian. She somehow still gives it a, I wouldn't say whimsical, but there's a nice um, pace and the story moves along and the characters feel very honest. And this, these were three stories that all had a theme about sleeping and the different ways the characters were sleeping to avoid something in their life or um, to overcome grief. Uh, it was really lovely to read and um, yeah, just she just has a nice engaging tone. It's the sort of writing that you like spending time with, if that makes sense. So that was Asleep by Banana Yoshimoto. And we had The White Book by Han Kang, Tran sorry, translated by Deborah Smith. And Asleep was translated by Michael Emmerich. Um, so The White Book, a series of vignettes, uh, which I think she calls a novel, flowing from the death of her sister as a baby. So I didn't really love this, but I think I was trying to read it as uh, maybe too quickly. And I think if you just read each, you know, a chapter a day, for example, because they're only one page or two pages long, um, you could, and really sat with it for a while, you could get a lot out of it. And her writing is just very clear and beautiful. Um, and the stories, are, there's something very delicate about it. So I really sort of admired it, but I, it wasn't a book that I got got into or got swept up in. So that was the white book. Then Fire in the Blood by Irene Nemirovsky, translated by Sandra Smith. And this is, I love Irene Nemirovsky's writing. She died in 1942 at Auschwitz, tragically. Uh, but before that, she was writing a novel a year. So there is actually quite a good body of work, despite the fact that she died young. Um, and I think I've read about three of her books. So this is a short novel, and it's all about a family in rural France and the secrets behind the closed doors, and, a, and in particular, a couple who are... The, the perfect couple and she's the perfect mother and wife and they're very happy, very content and um, what secrets might be hidden behind that facade um, and what happens when things get revealed and exposed and it's also a bit of a um, philosophy about whether it's best to live in a hedonistic way and take risks and do things that might not be sensible or and you know might have certain consequences or whether it's good to better to be dutiful and you know do the right thing and so on and with you know what's best so it, it's really interesting it's a lovely her writing is so elegant it's so easy to read and it's very it really rings true and I know she spent time in this part of France and she's observed very closely how the people um, interact and how they live she seems to do it so effortlessly and I'm sure that that comes from a lot of practice and a lot of work but it just reads really naturally and really one of those stories that you can just immerse yourself in and feel like you're in France. So this is Fire in the Blood by Irene Nemirovsky, translated by Sandra Smith. That's the end of the Women in Translation books. I do have a couple still to read, but um, this one, the Dev A Devil Comes to Town by Paolo Morensig, um, who's not a woman, but it is translated by a woman, um, Anne Milano 
Apple or Appel. She apparently is quite a renowned translator and I'm now eager to read more books translated by her. Um, so I feel like that sort of counts for women in translation in terms of highlighting the work of translators and women translators. Um, I really loved this. I, I actually uh, bought it on a whim. So this is one of those rare times that I buy a book with really no idea why I'm buying it <laughs> other than, um, you know, the striking cover, uh, the fact that it's um, an Italian. I don't have many Italian books or books in translation by Italian authors. Um, so that's always something I'm looking for. And um, I, I didn't, so I didn't know what to expect, but I loved it from the first page. And it's quite absurd. It's, and it's had lots of rave reviews, but to give you an idea, um, the observer said, think Yorgos Lanthimos directing The Master and Margarita. So Yorgos Lanthimos, who I think directed The Favourite, is that the, what's the movie with that just won the Oscar for um, Olivia Coleman? You know the one I'm talking about. Quite strong and with a sense of the absurd. And so, yeah, I didn't know what to expect, but that blurb caught my attention. And so the story, it's a story within a story, but it's essentially a priest talking about the time that he went to a, live in a small village in Switzerland and um, the people there were all writing stories. And so it was this really literary village um, and the devil came to town in the form of a publisher, like a brash publisher who rolled up in this really fancy car and offered to, um, you know, publish a story. They had a competition and throwing some money around and then the fallout from that. And so it's really, it sounds a bit bizarre and it is, but the, the writing is so strong and so lively and I just, from the first page, I felt like I was in the hands of someone who just was A, having fun, and you have a sense of that, but B, absolutely in control of the story and what they wanted to say. And yeah, it was just such an interesting premise. It made me want to read The Master and Margarita, which is the book that has been uh, the, has spent the longest time on my TBR. And yeah, I just really loved this. So that's A Devil Comes to Town by Paolo Morensig, translated by, uh, I just told you, didn't I? By Anne Milano Appel. Then I'm just going to move back a bit because I think the sun is really all over the place. Three Women by Lisa Tadeo. So a very buzzy book. We did this for the podcast. I didn't know what to expect. I went into it thinking um, the premise of three women and exploring their relationships and their desires. I, I must say that didn't grab me, but I'm, you know, I was intrigued and I found it really well written. I think her writing is exceptionally good and it, it's interesting she also has written short stories and I think that comes through that sense of structuring a story so that it has pace and it keeps you turning the page. Um, I, the, it's the three stories of, um, what are their names? Maggie, Lena and Sloane. And they all have different, they're in different circumstances. Um, Maggie had an affair with her teacher. Sloane is married to a man who likes her to be with other men. And then Lena is in a loveless marriage, which she leaves and starts an affair with her high school boyfriend. In each case, they are very much at the whim of their, the men in their life are really driving these relationships and have most, in most cases, have the power or most of the power and it's really, I found, not about the women's desires, but about the men's desires. And taking a step back from it, I think it's really very much status quo. You know, the men are the ones in charge and it's the women doing what their, their men want. So I found that quite depressing. So I started off really engaged and just, it was compulsive. You know, you keep turning the page. And then I just found it a bit bleak. And I wished that these women would be a bit more independent and, 
you know, realise that they are enough without needing these men um, and needing to please the men all the time. I just, yeah, I found it not very uplifting in that way. But it is the women's perspective. So even though it's more about the men, it is the women telling the story, which is is something different. So I, I'm glad I read it, but, you know, I'm not raving about it the way some people have been. But I think she's done an amazing job. It's eight years worth of work and the the um, the writing is is really lively and really good. So that's three women. And then I read The Ditch by Herman Koch, which is translated by Sam Garrett. So Herman Koch wrote The Dinner, which was then made into a movie. And it, that's about the two couples whose um, son has done something wrong and how they deal with it. And he wrote Summer House with a Swimming Pool and Mr. M or Mrs. M. I didn't really love this. I found it quite readable. Like I did keep wanting to read it and turn the page, but it's about a man who suspects, it's he's the Lord Mayor of Amsterdam and he suspects that his wife is having an affair. And really, that doesn't get resolved until quite near the end. So you, it's slow in that sense, in the sense that not a lot happens. Um, he keeps suspecting and changes his behavior accordingly, where he's then trying not to look suspicious, but carry on as normal, but also keep a close eye on her and so on. But in fact, you don't find out much um, for quite some time. So it's quite drawn out. And at the same time, his parents have told him that they want to end their lives and they're 95 now. So despite the fact they're remarkably fit and active at 95, um, that's the decision that they've come to. So he's grappling with that. I didn't really ever think that fitted in with the the main plot. So I'm not sure. I've um, we're doing it on the podcast, so we'll, I'll wait and see what Amanda thought because she chose this one. Um, I'll be interested to see her, without giving away spoilers, what she thought. But yeah, I find his writing quite dark in that he's not bringing, it doesn't bring out the best in people. He shows people sort of their, their less likable traits. So in that sense, it's a bit, it's not nice to read, if that makes sense. Not that a book has to be nice, but I don't warm to it. There's something about it that I find a bit nasty. And I'm not sure, I'm sure there's a better word for that. But yeah, I didn't love this. I found it a bit drawn out. And then towards the end, it takes on a, um, there's a supernatural aspect towards the end, which didn't work for me. So yeah, for me, that was a, you know, like a, two or three out of five book, but I'll be very keen to hear what Amanda thinks. That's The Ditch. And then we have Too Much Lit by Melissa Lukashenko, which is brilliant. So this is an Australian book. Melissa Lukashenko's an Abor part Aboriginal, part European descent, um, Australian author. And this won the Miles Franklin Award for 2019, which is the award for the best novel of the highest literary merit in Australia and I loved this. I haven't read Melissa Lukashenko before but I have been meaning to and this one, so her other book that's very well known is Mullumbimby I believe but this is a story of Kerry. So Kerry has gone to live in Brisbane but she goes back to her hometown which they, what does she, what's her hometown? Durongo um, in Bunjalung country. So um, there are about 250 or more language groups of different languages of Aboriginal people in Australia and different parts of the country that they are connected with. So Melissa Lukashenko is of Bunjalung heritage and the book is set there. The town is fictional, but she's set it in Bunjalung country. So it's South Queensland and Northern New South Wales. And so Kerry drives in on her Harley Davidson, which may or may not be stolen. And her pop, her grandfather is ill. So he's dying. Um, her mother's there and her brother, Ken. And so that makes up their, their sort of family. There's another brother called Black Superman. 
and he comes into the story as well and she and then Ken has a son Donnie who's living with them um, so there are the characters are larger than life they're flawed they're very they really ring true um, there's a lot of humor in this and it goes on so that her grandfather is unwell and she doesn't really want to stay there she wants to get back to Brisbane as soon as possible um, but of course you know she gets drawn back into the family life there and it's a dysfunctional family there are a lot of issues that are touched on in the book some trigger warnings for family violence and things like that but it is told with such honesty such humor and her language is wonderful so she includes Bunjalung words and it, um, that and the dialogue and everything really is so it rings so true you feel as if you're there it's very immersive you feel like you're right there um, with these people and you can hear them speaking it's it's so and the setting is also really well evoked so you you can see and smell and hear everything that's going on um, the other thing that I loved about this is that she's telling a story we had the podcast Annie and Amanda and I all did this one and we've talked about I mean we read a lot of literary fiction and we love it and we you know we get so much out of that but sometimes it's not a pacey story and so you're really concentrating and it's very serious and highbrow whereas this is actually um, every scene there's something that ha will happen or might happen and you turn the page to find out how this conflict will be resolved and what will happen next and um, so I really appreciated that so that's too much lip I highly recommend this if you can get it I'm not sure how widely available it is overseas but um, I do I believe at least on in ebook you'll be able to get it so look out for that one and then another one that I really loved which is 10 minutes 38 seconds in this strange world by Elif Shafak. This is the story of Layla who's dying and her brain is still working for this sort of 10 minutes and she has worked as a prostitute in Istanbul and she's reflecting back on her life so her early family life and then her time in the brothel with Sweet Ma who she also called Bitter Ma and her friends and it's I just loved it I find it hard to explain why I didn't quite know what to expect but I just loved it I loved the the writing it's very easy to read it's not it's lyrical without being too poetic or too fussy it's really um, has a lovely flow she has, it feels very natural I loved Layla the character the main protagonist and I felt as if I, I read quite a lot of Oran Pamuk's work which is also set in often in well set in Turkey and often in Istanbul and I feel like his work is very intricate and very immersive and so I feel like I've spent some time there if you like whereas this gave me I feel like with Elif Shafak's book I've now had that from a woman's perspective and I've it's from and from pers the perspective of other sort of marginalized people in Istanbul society and so that was a really refreshing and her friends are all wonderful characters and I actually loved the fact that it was a story about friendship and so despite the fact that it's a sad premise in that Layla is dying it felt very uplifting and it's full of hope and love and survival and resilience and I just I just really enjoyed it I, well, I can't explain why because it not, it's not all that plot driven I mean the, I suppose you're reading to find out how did she die or what you know what happened to Layla and how did her friendships develop because that's they're all interesting stories with within in themselves but you know normally I'd want more of a plot but this one just had had a good pace and yeah I just found it a really comforting tone and 
very yeah really fresh and engaging so i really recommend that it's on the book a long list so we'll find out soon if it makes it onto the short list um, that's 10 minutes 38 seconds in this strange world and i'm now going to go back and read the bastard of istanbul which i have on my shelf by elif shafak so i'm looking forward to that one so that is the wrap up for august sorry about the funny sun well the beautiful sunlight but that's doing funny things um, with the lighting uh, let me know what you've been up to and what you've been reading and i'll see you soon bye